planet. It sounds like there's something in the wall and I can't figure out what's in the wall. I think there are birds in there. I think there are birds in there. Welcome back, fellow friends. Today we will be diving into Treasure Planet, one of my personal favorite Disney films. It's a movie I find people either watch growing up and love, they watched and hated, or they never knew existed. We'll be breaking it down into several parts. The plot, how it was made, how it was received by audiences, and we will be analyzing why it's arguably the best underrated Disney film. Let's just get into it, okay? Treasure Planet is a 2002 science fantasy action adventure film Film, produced by Walt Disney Feature Animation and released by Walt Disney Pictures in 2002. This is Disney's 43rd animated feature film. It's a science fiction adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's 1883 novel Treasure Island. It's a retelling of the story but in outer space. It employs a technique of using 2D traditional animation as well as 3D computer animation. It had a budget of 140 million dollars and it's the most expensive traditionally animated film ever made. The film ended up doing really poorly in the box office, but received generally positive reviews by critics. So, the plot. On the planet Montressor, a young Jim Hawkins is enchanted by stories of the legendary pirate Captain Nathaniel Flint and his ability to appear out of nowhere raiding passing ships and then disappearing in order to hide the loot in a mysterious place called Treasure Planet. It cuts to 12 years later and Jim has grown into an isolated troublemaker due to his father abandoning him and his mother. He seems troubled and generally lacks a sense of direction due to having no male role model in his life. He reluctantly helps his mother Sarah run the family's Benbow Inn. One day a spaceship crashes near the inn and the dying pilot Billy Bones gives Jim a sphere and tells him to beware of the cyborg. Suddenly a gang of pirates raid and burn the inn to the ground while Jim, his mother, and their dog-like friend Dr. Delbert Doppler, they end up fleeing to Doppler's study where Jim discovers that the sphere is a holographic projector containing a star map leading to the location of Treasure Planet. Despite his mom's reluctance, Jim and Doppler decide to travel to Treasure Planet in order to gain the funds to rebuild the inn. Doppler has a lot of money and commissions the ship RLS Legacy on a mission to find Treasure Planet. The ship is commanded by the feline Captain Amelia. The crew is kind of a motley bunch and it's later revealed it is led by the half-robot cook John Silver, whom Jim suspects is a cyborg that he was warned about by Billy Bones. Jim is set down to work in the galley where he's supervised by Silver. Despite Jim's mistrust of Silver, they soon form a tenuous father-son relationship. Also, Silver has a little pet named Morph who can transform into different objects and he's really, really cute. As the ship reaches Treasure Planet, Jim overhears the crew and soon discovers that they are indeed pirates led by Silver and a mutiny erupts. Jim, Doppler, and Amelia prepare to abandon the ship. Jim retrieves the map and Silver targets him but cannot bring himself to shoot Jim and allows the others to escape with him. The groups eventually shot down during their escape, injuring Amelia, and they discovered that they don't actually have the map. The map was actually morphed in disguise and the map is still actually on the ship in a coil of rope. While exploring Treasure Planet's forest, they soon meet Ben, an abandoned navigational robot who has lost his primary memory and invites them to his home for shelter. That's where the pirates corner the group there. Using a secret passage, Jim, Morph, and Ben hijack a longboat to fly back to the legacy and attempt to retrieve the map. They obtain the map, but upon returning, they are caught by Silver and his crew, who've already captured Doppler and Amelia. Silver forces Jim to use a map, directing them to the portal that opens to any location in the universe, which Jim realizes is how Flint conducted his raids. They open the portal to the center of Treasure Planet. Discovering the planet is really an ancient machine that Flint commandeered to stow his treasure. But as they enter the core of the planet, they trigger a sensor. As the pirates begin to collect the loot, Jim finds the skeletal remains of Flint, and he is holding the missing components to Ben's cognitive computer. He reinserts it, and Ben immediately recalls that Flint had rigged the planet to explode upon the treasure's discovery. The planet soon begins to fall apart, and not wanting to go empty-handed, Silver attempts to escape on Flint's ship, but eventually lets it go to save Jim's life. They get out of Treasure Planet. Jim finds Silver below the decks, about to escape his impending judgment. He allows him to go and Silver asks him to keep more, as well as providing him a handful of treasure he managed to save to rebuild the Benbo Inn, believing Jim will rattle the stars. Sometime later, a party is hosted to rebuild the inn. Doppler and Amelia have married and they have cute little children of their own, and Jim, having matured under Silver's mentorship, has become an interstellar cadet. So the movie ends with Jim looking up into the sky and seeing an image of Silver winking at him in the clouds. Treasure Planet took a 
about roughly four and a half years to create. But the concept of Treasure Planet, which was originally going to be called Treasure Planet in Space, it was pitched back way back in 1985 by Ron Clements and John Musker as they were pitching the idea for The Little Mermaid. The pitch was actually rejected the first time around by Michael Esner, who knew Paramount Pictures was developing a Star Trek sequel with a Treasure Island angle, which eventually went to be unproduced. The idea was pitched then again in 1989, following the release of The Little Mermaid, but the studio expressed disinterest again. Following the release of Aladdin, the idea was pitched for a third time, but Jeffrey Katzenberg, who at the time was the chief of Walt Disney Studios, said he just wasn't interested in the idea. Angered by the rejection again, Musker and Clements took the idea to Ron E. Disney, who backed up the filmmakers, and made his wishes well known to Eisner, who in turn then agreed that they could make their movie. In 1995, their contract was renegotiated to commence the development of Treasure Planet after the film Hercules reached its completion. Since Musker and Clements wanted to be able to move the camera around a lot like Steven Spielberg or James Cameron, the delay in production was actually beneficial because the technology at the time had to develop so they could be able to do so. Principal animation for the film began in 2000 with roughly 350 crew members working on it. In 2002, Roy Conley estimated there were around 1,027 crew members listed in the screen credits. According to Conley, Clements wanted to create a space world that was warm and had more life to it than you would normally think in a science fiction film. Opposed to the stainless steel blue smoke coming from the bowels of a heavy pipe laden. They did this because they believed it would make the film more fun and they believed that having the characters wear spacesuits or space helmets would take all the romance out of it. And the crew created the concept of Ethereum, which is an outer space filled with atmosphere. So, the writing. Writer Rob Edwards states that it was extremely challenging to take the classic concept and make it into an outer space movie. Edwards goes on to say they did a lot of things to make the film more modern and the idea behind the setting of the film in outer space was to make the story as exciting for kids now as it was back then. With regards to adapting the characters from book to film, Ron Clements mentioned that Jim Hawkins in the book is a very smart and very capable kid. In the adaptation they wanted to keep some of this but they wanted to make him troubled as well and make it seem like he didn't really know who he is and he's kind of searching for a purpose. While retaining the aforementioned characters that's from the original character, the mentor figures for Jim Hawkins in the novel are Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey, who John Musker described as one is more comic and the other one's very straight. These two characteristics were fused into Dr. Doppler. Clements also mentions that the relationship between Jim Hawkins and John Silver was there to some degree in the novel, but they wanted to emphasize that more in the film. Casting director Ruth Lambert held a series of auditions for the film in New York, Los Angeles, and London, but the crew already had some actors in mind for the two major characters. The character of Dr. Doppler was written with David Hyde Pierce in mind, and Pierce was given a copy of the Treasure Planet script along with the preliminary sketches of the character and the film's scenic elements while he was working on Pixar's A Bug Life in 1998. He stated that the script was fantastic and the look was so compelling that he had to accept the role. Likewise, the character of Captain Amelia was developed with the idea that Emma Thompson would provide her voice for the role. Clement said we offered it to her and she was really excited about it. She was actually pregnant during the time of filming so it was really great for her because she didn't have to train for a role and she could just use her voice. There were actually no characters initially in mind for John Silver and Jim Hawkins. Ryan Murray ended up voicing John Silver and Joseph Gordon-Levitt ended up voicing Jim Hawkins. They were actually signed after months of auditions. Gordon Levitt said that he was attracted to the film initially because it's a Disney animated film and Disney animated movies are a class act within themselves and to be part of that tradition would be unbelievable. Musker mentioned that Gordon Levitt combined enough vulnerability and intelligence and a combination of youthfulness but incompleteness and they really liked his approach. So the animation. The animators took Deep Canvas, a technology which they had initially developed for Tarzan in 1999 and came up with a process they called virtual sets wherein they created entire 360 degree sets where they would begin staging the scenes. They combined this process with traditionally drawn characters in order to achieve a painted image with depth perception. Enabled the crew 
to place a camera anywhere in the set and maneuver it as they would maneuver a camera for a live action film. For the animation of Treasure Planet, there are three main elements that were essential to the production of this film. The traditional 2D character animations that Disney is super well known for, three-dimensional character animation, and computer-generated or CG environments. So how is it received by the box office? As I mentioned before, this film did really poorly in the box office, costing $140 million to create and earning back $38 million in Canada and the US, and then $110 million worldwide. It received generally positive reviews by critics and audiences, and it was nominated for Best Animated Feature at the 75th Academy Awards. Treasure Planet grossed about $12 million the opening weekend, and it ranked fourth place behind Harry Potter Chamber of Secrets, Die Another day and Disney's own Santa Claus 2. In 2014, the Los Angeles Times said that this was one of the most expensive films to flop in theaters. There was talk early on about doing a Treasure Planet 2, but after how it did in box offices, being a huge disappointment, it was cancelled. It's actually really disappointing to see such a good movie be so underrated and do so poorly in the box office, and I think this is due to it being released on the same weekend as some of the biggest films that year but was this film good? Let's go over it. There are many elements, in my opinion, that make this movie amazing. The overall style of the movie is really interesting and unique, and taking a screenshot out of the movie, you recognize it as its own thing which is pretty interesting. And I love that they cross it over with a steampunk style. I know not a lot of people love the steampunk style, but I think it's so great and so clever. Aesthetically, this movie is really easy on the eyes, and I love the use of the different technology to make it come to life. I also think the voice acting is really great in this movie and definitely gets you immersed in the feel of the movie. The casting of Joseph Gordon-Levitt for Jim Hawkins was a really great idea. I think he captured the character really well and he gave it kind of a boyish charm to it. He also made the character incredibly likable. I think the character of Jim Hawkins has such a deep level of individualism that it makes him really likable as well. Don't you get Get it? I screwed up. I mean, for two seconds, I thought that maybe I could do something right, but ah, I just just forget it. I think the strongest part and the best part for me was the relationship between John Silver and Jim Hawkins. It's a very unique and compelling part of the story. So my neighbors currently vacuuming. Hopefully that doesn't catch up on camera. And if it does, I'm sorry. My neighbor's ruining my life. As I was saying, Jim Hawkins and John Silver's relationship in the movie is kind of what makes the movie for me. It is not very often where we get to see in a Disney animation the character have both parents let alone a character that has an absent father or absent parent in general. It shows the struggle of a boy who has lost a strong father figure in his life and therefore has lost his way. If Jim had a present father in this movie, then this film wouldn't be as good, period. <laughs> this is because it wouldn't have allowed him to develop such a deep connection with John Silver. Not having a father role model in Jim's life helps play into the whole movie and drives a character. At the beginning, we can see that Jim feels confused and lacks direction. Throughout the movie, we see him change and become more of a man as he has Silver be a role model in his life. A male figure that he has truly never got to experience, but also has always wanted. It also fuels Jim to make many of the decisions he does in the movie, such as when he feels upset that John Silver betrayed him and then letting him go at the end as well. This kind of relationship between Jim and Silver is something that is actually really hard to capture on film, let alone an animated film. The relation between these two characters makes the movie interesting and compelling to watch unfold. And as a watcher, you feel betrayed as well when you find out Silver's ulterior motives. And you can empathize with Jim when he decides to let him escape at the end. Ultimately, this movie's so good because it was just really a passion project from the beginning to the very end. After the many adversities the film faced, such as being rejected three times and waiting for the technology, it's incredible that this movie was made and you can tell there's a lot of light behind this movie and the creators of it really cared about it. And that's really hard to not feel as you're watching it. In conclusion, this is one of my favorite Disney films and I think it is one of the most underrated. Tell me what you think below in the comments. Did you watch this movie? Did you like it? 
Did you hate it? Did you hate the steampunk style? I would love to hear your thoughts. That's all I got for today. I hope to see you guys soon. Bye!